Hi, everybody. My name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami with the Camper Report Show. And on this Camper Report Show, you know, we talk about our relationship with RV business in Woodalls. Today, we are going to sit down with Ben Quiggle, the editor-in-chief of Woodalls Campground Magazine, and find out all the new trends coming for this upcoming camping season. How about you, Bob? That's great. I'm, I'm going to be interviewing Randy Murray. We've had Randy on before. He's director of operations at Pete's RV Center. They're a large uh, RV dealership in the Northeast region, down in South Carolina. And he was so impressed with the section that we did on Chris Doherty and uh, James from PRVCA talking about technicians. He yep. wants to talk about technicians. So we're going to expand our technician conversation. There we go. It's maybe Thanks. second career for somebody. Who knows? Great. Okay. Those stories, those stories and more coming up right here. Where, Bob? On the Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everyone. Hey there, RVers. We get it. Your insurance and warranty needs are as unique as your travel destinations. That's why RVer Insurance has teamed up with Wholesale Warranties to cover all the bases. From health insurance to RV coverage and warranties, we've got you sorted every step of the way. With a solid track record in providing top-notch health insurance and affordable RV insurance options, RV insurance has you covered. And for those unexpected repair bills, look no further than our friends at Wholesale Warranties, leaders in reliable coverage and customer support. Start your RV protection journey today at rverinsurance.com or wholesalewarranties.com slash rverinsurance. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Camp Report Show. This is our news segment. My name is John DePietro. That young man over there is Bob Zagami. And Bob, in the news this week, there's a little bit of everything. There's inside and outside. Now, what I mean by inside and outside is our friends at GE Profile. And, um, you know, they're the appliance manufacturers. GE Profile is a high-end uh, refrigerator, stove, dishwasher, manufacturer appliance appliance appliance. Okay. Appliance. <laughs> appliance yeah that's about the best way to do it and they've come out with a new series of units actually a gas stove in particular designed for RVers that want to kick up their cooking skills a little bit in their RV would you talk about that because I've got mixed feelings on this which we'll talk about yeah you know, it's, it's funny I, I I do too but of course GE has been the world leader in appliances forever and ever and ever. And now they've targeted, they've been in the RV market for about four years. They came in and have a distribution company on some of the low end products that were made for the RV industry. Now they're putting that nameplate on the GE profile, which is what I've got in my kitchen for uh, a lot of our appliances. Yep. And you're right. It is the top of the line. This is probably the same. It is the same technology. This is as good as your household stove and yep. range. And it's in that point, then you know, we may you know we don't have to talk about this beforehand, but we may have the same concern. My concern is a lot of people don't cook in their kitchens. They don't cook in, in the kitchen. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> you know, when I read that story, they said they did extensive yeah. research with people who cook certain products in their RV. Okay. Now, I've always felt that market research is basically an exercise you go through to find answers for the conclusion that you've already drawn before you've asked right. the first question. Okay. At least government research is that way. But yeah. everything that I've found is that people don't want to eat inside their RV. They want to buy a hundred or two hundred dollar Blackstone grill, or they've used their outdoor kitchen. And now the units, you know, so many RV. Um, manufacturers are hooking up the propane attachment so they can uh, hook their grill up outside the unit. Why in the world would you want to invest in extra money for a high-end stove inside the unit? I, I can't figure it out. Well, there it, it's either going to be a home run or it's going to be a dud. Now, they, maybe their research showed that if RVs had a range, a stove equivalent to what they have at home, yeah. then they would most likely use it more because that's always been an area where 
and it's there, it's convenient. But I mean, I remember, you know, getting down on my knees with matches, trying to light the I, I propane know. stove right. in a stove. Right. And I said, well, hold, I'll just cook outside on the grill. So the, they're bringing the home convenience to this. They're bringing the quality of GE. They're bringing the electronic ignitions. And they're bringing it. They're bringing the full game. So if well, if, there, they're, if the research is right, then you know OEMs will start putting these into a lot of the units, and and maybe some people will say, "I'll I'll cook inside and take it outside." But you're right. I. It okay. hit me the same way. It's going to be very interesting, interesting to see the adoption, but both look, of the factors in the consumers. Let, let's look at what we've experienced so far. Okay. Um, people want to cook and they want to cook on a high end stove. Now, all the research and all the observer, observing observations that I've done, the higher the end of the unit, the RV. In other words, when you get into the Prevost conversions and the Featherlight and uh, uh, all the other conversion companies, um, they've got a lot of new technology in their kitchen. But I have never heard of anyone who actually cooks in their kitchen. Okay, They even have dishwashers in, in some of those units. Okay, We use paper plates or styrofoam plates. It's going to be really interesting to see the adoption of this product if, if it becomes adopted at all. Um, but you know what? Why don't we do this right now? Let's ask our viewers what they think. Put your answer in your comments down below. Would you be willing to pay extra now, whether it's $100, $200, or $300 more for a high-end gas stove in your RV? Or do you prefer to rough it and have a, have a Blackstone or other type grill that you um, cook outside in your RV? So well, tell you, me down you, below. You, you, you bring up a good point because it doesn't say it just says GE is going to make the profile available in the RV industry, but it doesn't say if it's going to be, you know, at a quarter of a million dollars or up or are only on high end motor homes, you know, certainly not going to be in a pop up trailer. So that's a good no. point. Let's, let's, let's see what our fans say about having a GE profile in their uh, towable or their motor home. It'll yeah. be interesting. And, yeah. and my contention is this. The higher end the motorhome, the less the person cooks inside it. <laughs> okay. So yeah. that's that. Now, let's go to the total opposite end of the equation and talk about Storyteller Overland, which are, they don't even call themselves RVs. They call themselves adventure vehicles. And I did an interview with the founder down in, uh, in Tampa at the RV show back in January, which we're going to post very soon. But but they just got infused with um, lots of money from a venture capital firm. Talk about that. Yeah, it, it didn't say how much money, but the fact that they attracted the money is what's important because they were only founded in 2018. Yep. When they were founded in 2018, they weren't really part of the RV industry. They were the outlanders, overlanders. And yep. the, they it was a different group that was de beginning to develop in the outdoor adventure series, series right, and yeah. I, would, I would talk to a lot of our dealers at that time and they had no interest whatsoever in covering or bringing that type of a product on their lot but fast forward five years and the adoption of vehicles for the overland community we've we've brought that overland community into the rv industry which we we forecasted five years ago we said that it's it, it would be similar to uh, when the regular Class Bs came out, that dealers were slow to put them on the lot, and now every dealer has them in probably two or three brands. And yep. what I found, the most interesting thing I found on this, because I know Campers in in New Hampshire does sell the Storyland Overland, but it mentions that they now have forty dealers in the country. So yep. although they were designed to be the boondocking and the the one offs of people five years ago, I, I would. With this investment, with this stature in the company, they're they're mainstream RVers also. So we so a lot of mainstream RVers who wouldn't look at an overlander type product five years ago are now looking at it. But more importantly, they've brought that contingent with them. They've brought that yeah. segment with Storyland 
and others. So it's it's a recognition when people start to make significant investments. So they can expand the product line, they can yep. do a lot of other things. So it is a major investment and we should watch it very closely. Yep. Yep. And that is a new name that's in the industry as we segue to our um, final news story is that an iconic name in the RV industry is Coachman Industries. And the uh, former chair and the daughter of the founder of the company recently passed at not too old. And um, her name is Claire Skinner. Talk about Claire because she had a very interesting um, role in the industry because she certainly was one of the pioneering women in the RV industry. She was. I actually had a chance to meet Claire early in my RVing career when I first started writing in the industry. And she's the daughter of Tom Corson. And of course, Coachman was founded by Tom and Keith Corson. And, and many of the executives that we have in the industry today started their careers at Coachman. Yep. Include, including Bob Martin, the CEO of Thor Industries. Bob Martin, early in his career, was the Northeast sales rep for Coachman Industries and used to call on Brad Moore and, and Cam, you know, the, the Hirsch family and what have you. So Claire was significant, and she actually worked her way up to become the first woman chair of the RVDA Board of Directors. Now, there have been some since then, but she was chair in 2003 and 2004, and I started writing in the industry in uh, 1996. And then, of course, in 2008, Forest River purchased Coachman, but the brand is still out there. Uh, Claire was with the Coachman brand in the company for 23 years. So, yes, she was a pioneering woman in the industry and first chairman back in 20, 2003, 2004. So uh, so we've lost a legend, that's for sure, but she certainly made her impression on the RV industry. Yeah, there we go. So we got a new stove, a new adventure series, and um, the sad news of the passing of an RV industry icon. Those stories, where do we get all these stories, Bob? From Ben Quiggle at Woodall's Campground Magazine and Rick Kessler with RV Business. No, you know you've just created a firestorm because you gave Quiggle top billing over Kessler. I, I did it on purpose because your interview was with Quiggle this week. So okay, in yeah. honor of Ben Quiggle, yeah. we, we kind of switched the routine. And so we there put we Rick in second place. Yep. Oh, so it's, so. It's, it's Ben's week on the Camp Report Show. Those stars and more coming up right here on the Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everybody. Attention all RVers. Say goodbye to roof worries and hello to worry-free travel with RV Roof Magic. This revolutionary liquid butyl roof coating is specially formulated to protect your RV from the elements to extend its lifespan and prevent leaks. With simple application and outstanding results, RV Roof Magic is the go-to choice for RV owners seeking superior roof protection. Don't let roof maintenance issues hold you back. RV Roof Magic is the only liquid butyl rubber in the world that offers a one coat, no primer coverage and a 10 year warranty. Visit rvroofmagic.com slash RV life and extend your roof another 18 to 20 years. Welcome back, everybody, to the Camper Report Show. My guest this morning has been here before, but we're going to bring him back again. Randy Murray, Pete's RV Center. And Randy, you, you cover a lot of hats up there and you travel around the country. So tell us tell us your main role these days and uh, what impact it has on the many dealerships that Pete's RV Center has throughout the uh, Northeast and over to Indiana and down to South Carolina. Sure. Yeah, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> um, <laughs> currently, I am the director of orientation, which uh, means I'm uh, I build the teams and train the teams that are delivering the units. So that are giving the education, and uh, um, we are also scheduling the units after the sale, and we make uh, recommendations on things that may be needed to use the camper the way that you're looking to use it. So, in other words, you touch it from the time it comes into one of your facilities 
till the time that the customer gets the keys and drives off in their new RV. Pretty much. Yeah, we are the liaisons between sales and service and just kind of try to keep that customer moving throughout that process and uh, give them uh, the great experience, give them the education that they're looking for. And again, make the proper recommendations on if uh, if you're you if you're somebody that's off the grid or boondocking, you're going to we're going to make a lot of different recommendations than the person that camps like me that is more of a glamper and plugs in and <laughs> near the swimming pool and stuff like that. So. <laughs> well, you know, we talked after our show last week and you we were impressed with the PRVCA training and we had Chris Doherty on and James Lewandowski, but you are also a member of our advisory, technical advisory team at the New England RV Dealers Association, you and Chris Doherty and Ryan Hadley. And you wanted to talk about the importance of the RV technician, but let's talk about it from the dealership standpoint. Now, is that was what the association was going to do for training, but Walk us through maybe the career opportunities at RV dealerships, especially Pete's RV centers, with so many locations. What goes into the daily planning of that also? Um, I'll tell you probably more important now than, than any other time I could remember. And, and it's not just um, the RV industry. It's everybody's looking for help. Um, so um, getting people to engage or want to um, – think about your industry as maybe their future. And, and, and I, I uh, coming from the housing industry a million years ago, um, I discovered by accident the, the RV industry. I, I was sitting next to a guy at a bar, <laughs> as the story goes. <laughs> happened to be Terry Shepard, and him and I became friends. And long story short, 25 years later, I'm, I'm still working for the man's family. Um, and the RV industry gave me opportunities um, that I probably would have never had because it's literally the Wild West. If you're willing to work hard, apply yourself. Um, I know other people say this as well, but you truly can do what you want. I'm, I'm not an educated man. I'm an electrician by trade and I'm running departments in nine stores in seven states. And I, I can't even believe I'm here. Um, and, and I'm not the only story like that. I have many people in our organization that I work with that have come up through the ranks with me. Um, so as, as the RV technician um, and how I started in the industry, um, I, I didn't go to school. You know, you, you want to be a fireman or a policeman or an astronaut. You don't think about being the RV technician. Um, but there's so many different things that you do during a day as an RV technician. Not only are you a, a, a technician, but you're a plumber, you're an electrician, you're a welder, um, you're, you're a body man, you're a carpenter. Um, you have to do electronics now. We were, as I was struggling to come on your show this morning, dealing with trying to load Zoom on my computer. We've got to like uh, update computers and campers now. And so um, it, it's really an awesome industry to be in. And, and we work really hard at getting that out there to the masses with the job fairs. We have in-house recruiting. We're talking all the time. We're on uh, doing shows like this with you. Um, to try to promote it. So um, it's a great industry. And I, I can't I can't tell you what it's done for my me and my family. And I, I welcome anybody to come into it, especially on the technical side of things. because That's the most fun part for me. What, do you think do you think there was a turning point? Because I agree with everything you said. And those of us that are in the industry knew it and understood it. But it didn't seem to get out to the general public. Could we look to COVID as kind of a spring point where there were a lot of things that were really being done great, but we just weren't telling people about it. And then with COVID and the massive exposure that the RV industry got, both from a sales, but more importantly, from a service and a support standpoint, do, would you call that an inflection point where we really became mainstream and started to talk about the career of a technician instead of just hiring a technician? Um. It, for me, it's it, it's been that way for a long time, but I think we had a lot more people looking at it because let's face it, Bob, we put what three six hundred that more thousand units into the industry than we normally see in a in a short amount of time, and and it it, it takes it takes a few years to build a technician, a qualified technician, where we we were, we were launching way past that, so now it's kind of catch up a little bit, um, it, 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 and I think the importance is just. It personified now that we, you know, that, that uh, the need is definitely there even more so, um, as well as base space. 
Um, so watching the, the pop-ups come up with uh, the education, um, seeing the other, we're not the only dealers that are recruiting and going through all that and setting up education. So I, the, the industry is, is definitely working harder at um, bringing people into it on the technical side of things than they, than they once have. And, and I think, um, and you may validate this from a standpoint of Pete's, but other dealers, as I said in the past, when we needed technicians, we'd put a job posting out there, you bring them in for an interview, you'd hire them, and they were in your mix. But because of the complexities of the industry, the way that they are making the units, the technology that they're putting into the units, you have a much better story to tell about a career opportunity. So we don't look at it. It's not just a job. And I think that's the big thing that programs like PRBCA, programs like the RB Technical Institute, the National RB Training Academy down in Texas, all of these programs are mainstream now. They get a lot of attention in the press. Does it make your job any easier? Or is the volume of work still so high that you're you're grasping for every tech that you can get and get through the door and get them into your system versus somebody else's. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't plan that. That, that. that just came out of my mouth. And it, 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 there's plenty uh, of work. There, there definitely is plenty of work. And in the RV industry is or a, a typical RV shop is an interesting place and it's a different dynamic than most of the other um, shops out there that, that I've, I've worked in body shops. I've, I'm a mechanic. Um, I've been a welder. Um, I'm an electrician by trade. So prior to the RV industry, I, I was able to work in a lot of the blue collar environments and, and I understand very well on how they work. In an RV shop, um, you can come in as an entry level person. You can even come in as a detailer. We've got many detailers and lot porters that have worked uh, their way up through the ranks. And, and the RV dealers, um, even as, as the large conglomerates, they still like to hire from within because a lot of the things that we do are very specified to our industry. So it's not like there's lots of other people out there doing driving a, a forklift or a tractor to move a camper. <laughs> you know, who else does that? No one. <laughs> so um, we, we like to hire within and move up. But in, in an RV shop, you start out with the, the PDI side of the shop, which is the pre-delivery inspection, getting the new units ready for delivery, going through starting the warranty processes, making sure they're safe for use. So it's very repetitive. Um, and, and the repetitive this of that also allows you to push the buttons and learn how an RV works and start to see some of the 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 um, inconsistencies that we see on the warranty side as we're putting these things into use, the, the adjustments that need to be made, how the appliances work. If there's an issue with an appliance when it goes into use for the first time, what do you do at that point? And that's really how you work your way into the tech side of the shop or the warranty side of the shop, which is where some of the more advanced tech techs work, um, guys and gals that have more experience and are better at troubleshooting, things like that. So it's a really natural progression to go through the shop. And now if you come through with a skill from another trade, um, you know, your electrical uh, plumber, carpenter, or whatever, you may skip a couple of those steps and jump right over into the warranty side of the shop if that's what your specialties are and that's what we're looking for. Um, but it's very, I don't want to say it's easy to make the progression, but the progression is there. So if you want it, it can be a, a very fulfilling um, pathway from being an entry level person into the PDI side of the shop to being a very skilled, um, uh, certified master technician making a very decent salary to provide for their family. So it, 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 it can be a lifelong thing if you want it to be. It's interesting. What about, uh, because camping and RVing have been out there now for 50, 60, in some cases, 100 years. So we've had a lot of generations that have gone camping with their parents. Do you find a lot of people who are campers in general looking at new careers or is it the younger people who had camped in their youth, but because they had that and now they see the technology, they're familiar with the technology and the skill sets that you need, are you more likely to find them easier now than in the past? That's a great question, Bob. And, and you think that that would be the case or like someone loved camping so much they wanted to be in that industry. And I, I don't have that story. Unfortunately, I, I stumbled across a camper because I thought they were kind of cool. And that's when I befriended Terry. And that's kind of how I got into the industry. He asked me if I wanted to come into the industry. Um, I've seen some people 
Um, I, I carry around special business cards when I recognize someone that does a good job at their job that I hand them with my cell phone number on it. <laughs> so, um, but I don't have the story of the guy that like, I've camped my whole life and I just want to do, I do have, I interview some people that are interested in camping or want to learn more about it. And they're kind of looking for a pathway. So I'm going to say I have hired some of those people, but not on the tech side, mostly um, on the orientation side or in the parts store. Interesting. I, I mentioned that you're on the technical advisory team at uh, the New England RV yeah. Deal Association, uh, along with Ryan Hadley, who, who's a mobile tech. And you've developed a great relationship with Ryan. Explain the role and wh why other dealers should be looking at uh, mobile techs to supplement what they're doing and the opportunities of working with dealers for a mobile independent tech who has some of the skills that you mean, may need may not need every day but you may need someday. And Ryan, a good friend of mine, Ryan's a great guy. Ryan and I talk uh, most every week with uh, either something I got going on or something he's got going on, just bouncing ideas off each other. Um, and, and Ryan's done very well for himself. I, I don't know Ryan's whole story. I don't know, like pre-RV tech, I don't know Ryan. <laughs> but um, on the RV tech side of things, for Ryan at, at, at our dealership, Pete's RV made it a, the decision um 10 plus years ago probably now that we we were no longer going to do road service because it we we have a huge market um and um it, it just wasn't cost effective with the guys out there like ryan so what we decided to do is focus on our um our techs and utilize guys the mobile rv service in the different areas that are our markets and so what ryan does for me not all of our customers can move their units around um we we deliver units to campgrounds we have seasonal customers but like you bob if i, I mean seacoast i'm or wherever you bought yours i'm sure that, that they have to send mobile guys out because you're not towing that 12 wide in <laughs> um so um, th that's where the, it's an important for the dealer. And you almost, even though you're not cutting their paycheck every week or every two weeks, whatever your payroll is set up at, they become a member of the family. They become someone that you can trust and you respect and you know how they work and you know that they're going to take care of your customers. So it's almost like having another technician, even though they're not employed by you, because we you do work with them that closely and, and they do help you out and hopefully vice versa. Um, I can't imagine a road tech that doesn't have enough work to get through, but like maybe in the winter months or help having a dealer give them more customers to help them, you know, with their maintenance issues. And after the warranties are up, um, you know, having that connection with the road service. And I don't see, I see Ryan probably expanding in the future and adding employees and adding maybe another truck because I'm sure that the work is available and, and we'd love to see that and help him promote that as well. Yeah, I agree. Super cool. <laughs> it is. All right. I guess this morning has been Randy Murray, Director of Orientation with Pete's RV. And, and, and real quickly, Randy, before we go, tell them how to get in touch with uh, Pete's RV and where you're located. Um, so PeteRV.com um, is the website. We're flagship store home base um, for most of us is Vermont on the management side of teams. But uh, we currently have locations in Indiana, Connecticut, uh, Plainville, Massachusetts, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Salem, Virginia, um, Chesapeake, Virginia, uh, Mountville, Pennsylvania, and Keystone RV down in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. How's that? So you, you are a very large regional independent player. And that, that's important in our industry today. And I really appreciate you stopping by and telling us the story and give us a little bit of a different background as far as what's happening down there. Fair enough? Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate your time, my friend. Thanks, Randy. The sign says Campfire Laughter and Learning 2024. We're at the Northeast Campground Association. And we're with Ben Quiggle, who's the editor-in-chief of Woodalls and uh, one of our collaborators here on the Camp Report Show. And uh, Ben, welcome back to New England. You get to come out once a year, and uh, this year, no snow, but a lot of cold. <laughs> I saw some snow when I was flying in, yeah. but it must be in the higher elevation areas, because yeah. it's not very snowy. It's sunny, but it, it's freaking cold outside. It is so. cold outside, and you got short sleeves on. Yeah, so I've got short sleeves on. You're so. paying the price for that, but you know, Ben, um, it's the time of year when campground owners and managers all get together because it's, it's um, not quite the 
opening days yet for yeah. at least the Northeast. Um, you're all over the country. I think you just got back from Wisconsin and you're yep. in New York prior to that. And uh, I think you were even in Branson back a few months yeah, ago, right? Yeah, they send me to all the tropical locations. All the, uh, the destinations. <laughs> yeah, all that, the destinations. Um, mm -hmm. Always nice to go to a low demand area in a low <laughs> demand season, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what are you seeing new in the industry? Because I know that um, we were talking about occupancy rates uh, and you had mentioned that the midweeks are starting to open up after the COVID time, but things are still yeah. good. Yeah, I think, you know, talking to park owners, um, you know, they're seeing less of a demand maybe. It, it, of course, it depends on the areas. You know, obviously, if you're still going to those hot tourist areas, you're still going to have a demand there, especially like around national, popular national parks. But in general, I think park owners are noticing, you know, that the reservations aren't coming in quite as quick. Maybe, you know, the weekends are still full, but maybe some more openings midweek. And, you know, people still want to get outdoors, but there's also other travel options available now. Um, and people are kind of taking advantage of those too. Any new trends you've seen in the campground industry as far as um, locally owned, uh, I hate to say mom and pop, but... Um, <laughs> owner-operator campgrounds as opposed to the corporate campgrounds. Yeah, I still, I mean, I we're still seeing people invest in their parks. Um, you know, park owners still have a good income coming in and they're still looking at ways to add amenities and accommodation units. So we're still seeing that. The EV trend was something we talked about the last couple of years, but I think that's, you know, slowed quite a bit here the last year because, you know, obviously on the federal end, things have kind of slowed on EV front too and automakers. And so I think park owners are kind of waiting to see what will happen down the road for that. But um, that, yeah. was, that was a big conversation a couple of years ago yeah. with um, people pulling into a campground with an either an electric vehicle or, you know, for a tow vehicle. Uh, and how are they going to plug it in yeah. to the same pedestal and not charge, you know, not cost the campground owner an arm and a leg to charge oh, yeah. two vehicles for the yep. price of one. Yeah, and I think a lot of park owners have updated their policies on that front. They're more aware of the issue. Um, there are quite a few park owners that are metering, you know, looking at metering their electricity and seeing what that looks like at their parks. Um, so we'll just have to see you know, what happens with this EV trend, I guess, so. Yeah, and uh, I guess the idea of a fully electric RV that's been put back in them. I know uh, several major manufacturers had come out with models a couple years ago, but yeah. evidently the um, platforms, you know, the Fords or the Mercedes, um, they're not building the platform for the electric vehicle to... Uh, yeah, yeah, they're not making on. any money. Is what I heard. Yep. They, they weren't making very much money. Yep. So I know that was a big plan uh, at Tampa a few years ago. Oh, everybody electric RV, electric RV. But you know the big issue also was when you were towing a traditional trailer. You know yeah. whether it be a fifth wheel or a travel trailer um, with a Ford Lightning or you know I saw my first Tesla truck the other day. First <laughs> the live cyber truck. Cyber yeah. truck. I yeah. saw. I saw that being towed on the back of a truck in Florida. <laughs> Um, but you can't just pull into a uh, regular charger like you would with your car and charge it because you'd be blocking the roadway so that yeah yeah I think some of these places are you know looking at RV charging stations I know at Woodall's campground magazine I believe we published an article I think five or six months ago about a company that had developed a pull through like canopy um, EV charging station for like RVs and, and semi trucks and stuff. So, um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this trend takes off. And I know on the park owner side, they're just more, you know, concerned about what it's going to do to the electrical costs. Electricity costs have been going up and, you know, they're just looking at ways to kind of offset that cost. So hmm. are you seeing a situation at all where um, campgrounds been around for several years and the next generation is not interested in it? Are you seeing that? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, Certainly not the case with Normandy Farms. Yeah, I mean, it. I think, uh, if anything, the younger generation is really picking up the baton, sort of, and really are very interested in camping. And we've even seen that in, like, the work camper side where the, uh, you know, there's younger families taking to the road and taking work camping. Taking on the work camper. Yeah. Too. Yep. And uh, I think it's been a situation that... COVID really exposed the opportunity to uh, not necessarily have to be in an office anywhere. 
Um, yeah. Probably oh, even yeah. in your own particular situation, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think young families are seeing an opportunity to be able to go out with like their kids and be able to do a lot of different experiences and being able to travel and work at the same time. And I, I know I've thought about it, so I just got to get Rick to let me, you know, explore it a little more. So. A, little bit, a little bit more. <laughs> um, but you still see new investment groups coming in, buying up campgrounds and... Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, expanding on their offerings. Yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, I think when interest rates started going up, people were like, oh, it's going to slow down. But, you know, a lot of the developers we speak with say, you know, the profit margins are there. They're willing to take, do the development work, even with interest rates higher. And now it looks like they might come down a little bit. So that should help them out. But uh, yeah, I, I think every week, you know, we see stories of new developments or developers buying parks, uh, investment groups buying parks. Um, we just spoke with a guy in Tennessee who's building a Lockers Luxury Motor Coach Resort just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And this thing is going to be... Luxury ba- Motor Yeah, coach. basically going to be like a Las Vegas Motor Coach Resort. I don't know if your audience knows what that is, but these are basically you know lots that are going to be sold for like four hundred thousand to a million dollars at this park and then they also will have a transient component to it but this is definitely the more upscale version of camping and he's already got he's working on that park and he's got another park in the works so there's a big market i guess on the luxury side as well yeah where they're selling the space yeah and then you use it for x number of months and then lease it back to the uh lease it back to the operator that We'll sell them on a short-term basis. Well, you own the site, you know, you buy the lot and then they, yeah, they'll lease it for you when you're not there and you make a little bit of money from that and then the park does too. Kind of like if you buy a condo, but you're not going to be there, (laughs) you send it back to a uh, rental agent Yeah. and they can do it that way. Yeah. And this one has real fancy patios. I think it's like 60 foot uh, pad to park your humongous motor coach on it, which a lot of these people have large motor coaches you know and i've seen a luxury motor coach resort where they have actual bungalows so you're getting like a 1200 square foot house basically right next to your rv right right we saw that we you know they've got the 45 foot prevost yeah then they've got a 20 foot trailer that they pull their exotic car in yeah and then they've got room for a a golf cart and a bungalow and uh, yeah the hot tub and all of the uh, shrubbery around it gives a <laughs> privacy as well. So Yeah, I, I know there was a, a story I read where a doctor bought one for a million dollars and gifted one to his daughter. So maybe I should get my dad, you know, maybe I could talk to my dad. There you go. A million dollar RV site. There you so. go. Always something new. And uh, <laughs> Ben, um, Woodall's Campground Magazine, people can get the um, daily edition. Yep. Right. Uh, How can they sign up for that? So if you go to woodallcm.com and sign up, we do our daily emails, which news for the news in the campground industry, RV parks, glamping parks. And then we also have we're also on LinkedIn at Woodall CM um, on Facebook. uh, We we have a pretty active YouTube channel where we I host a, a show, a weekly show. And then we also do supplier stuff. And we also have a glamping show that we that we host. And uh so we have a bunch of different ways to connect and it's all free so all you have to do is sign up and even the print magazine is free there we go ben quiggle thank you so much for spending time with us here in massachusetts at the northeast campground association annual convention yeah well thank you thank you so much this is the camp report show